so much of Appalachia has a strong cultural presence. You know, I think Appalachian downtowns is a prime place for entrepreneurship. The resiliency and embedded nature that many of the businesses have you know, in their local community, you know, that, that idea of community spirit, com community awareness, the, the feeling that what they are doing is a passion of theirs and that they really want to provide some sort of needed services for others in their community. I think that's one of the things that sets Appalachia apart. People Incorporated is a community action agency, and community action started in the mid-1960s as part of President Johnson's War on Poverty. So the idea about for community action was to establish locally based organizations that are responsible for addressing the symptoms and causes of poverty in those communities. You know, we serve over 12,000 people per year. I think some of the most impactful work that we're doing is through our New Markets Tax Credits financing. Through that program, we have created over 6,500 jobs in Central Appalachia, being able to see the impact that we have not only for individual people, but for as communities as a whole, you know, really in my mind crystallizes what it is that People Inc. is about. Upper Ohio Valley is, um, while fairly narrow geographically in the Upper Ohio Valley, we have a great breadth of programs and activities spanning many disciplines. We want to achieve food security, and what that means for us is it's healthy economy, it's healthy people, it's food justice and equity so that uh, people across socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds can all enjoy it in a culturally appropriate way. In that sense, we organize our whole community into two main impact areas, one of which is public health and trying to use food as a tool to influence public health outcomes. The other side of Grow High Valley is economic development and mostly what our ARC Power Initiative was built around. It's, you know, jobs created and businesses started and businesses improved. And we're talking in these economic development terms or in these public health terms is that ultimately it's quality of life. It's you know, real justice and equity across, you know, all sectors of our community. Johnstown has taken a pretty big growth in the fact that there are a lot of small businesses downtown. And if you walk around, you can see on all of the street corners, the types of businesses that have popped up that weren't here before. So traditionally, this region was dependent upon coal and steel and rail. And unfortunately, those larger industries have gone away. At that point, it became important to diversify and figure out how best to serve the community. And it's really evolved into helping small businesses our focus has evolved from some of the larger, quote unquote, home run kind of attractions to really retaining the employment base we have here and helping small businesses get started and grow. Entrepreneurship is messy and there is no necessary right answer, right recipe for everyone. So the assistance that we provide is customized and it's different in each community even that we serve. And you have to get to know your client and you have to get to know how they react so that you can then identify what their pressure points are. I think that right now, especially in the city proper, we're seeing that turn into a lot of small businesses opening here, the coffee shops, the breweries. I think that whenever you have a strong city center, it then improves the overall region. Understanding that you're not gonna necessarily see change overnight, but it's really the long game that makes all the difference. Here in Southwest Virginia, you could look at almost any of the counties that we serve and see the, not only the environmental impacts, but also the economic impacts that the coal industry has had on the region for decades. The ARC's role in leveraging additional resources into those communities as a way to uh, help further stimulate economic development, to help improve the local workforce so that they are able to take advantage of available employment opportunities. Having access to those additional resources is truly making a difference in the communities that we serve. 
In 2019, People Incorporated was approached by representatives from Russell County, which is a, a neighboring county here in the coal fields, about our New Markets Tax Credits Program. They indicated that they had a business that was looking to relocate to the region and that the Industrial Development Authority, along with the town of Lebanon, were working on putting together a financing package to help them with that relocation. So that really began what resulted in a two-year process where we started working with local officials. We started working with the Polycap business itself. The total project size was over $11 million. People Incorporated made a $10 million investment into that project. And ultimately, we will create upwards of 40 new jobs there in the local community. The Appalachian Regional Commission gave us a power grant we applied for in late 2018 and was the startup capital that we needed to open up what's been a, a transformative uh, economic development and public health project, which is the public market in maybe the most prominent retail location in all of Wheeling, on the corner of 14th and Main, downtown Wheeling. It was like a place full of things grown by Ohio Valley people. They're feeding Ohio Valley people. There's all types of people coming there, you know, investing uh, with their, their purchases in like a future of Wheeling that circulates dollars within its own economy and is creating prosperity across the board. Getting an Appalachian Regional Commission power grant put us in that kind of rarefied air of these people who have like the staying power and have been doing this work for, in some, in some cases, multiple generations. When a small business wins, we win. And it's not personal gain. It's, oh my God, did you see that this business was doing this or that? And they got a contract and they got this and they have this many customers now and they surpassed this number of employees and we want to be part of that. And that's what excites us and gives us the passion. I have you know, spent my, my life and my working career you know, in Appalachia and seeing many of the changes and progress that we're making you know, as a region and as a whole it makes me you know, proud to live in Appalachia, proud to raise my family here. I love working on problems. I think that's like kind of an, uh, like a West Virginian or Appalachian characteristic. So you're like, you just, you know, you just kind of like built, gets built into your DNA. You just like solve problems all the time. You get creative. If we can just like have a community where everyone's trying to reinvent it and reimagine it and transform it into like a healthier place, that that's the destination, you know? So it's like, to an extent, we're like living in the destination. Hi, everyone. I'm China Riddle, ARC's digital strategist, and welcome to Sparking Innovation Through Entrepreneurial Ecosystems. I hope you enjoyed that video as much as I did. What three great examples of ARC partners who are building Appalachian businesses of all sizes. And as we saw, some folks are attracting businesses through relocation packages or offering retail space to local producers, or in Startup Allegheny's case, providing customized services to help entrepreneurs get the capital and the resources they need to succeed in our region. Um, so today on this panel, we're going to hone in on that last example, providing customized services to entrepreneurs. Even more specifically, we're going to talk about helping them access the capital they need to start their businesses and grow their ventures. Um, the way this panel is going to go is we're going to kick off talking to two investment partners uh, of ARCs, and then we're going to go to some of the businesses that their services have helped support and grow. Then we're going to go back to the investors, close out, and then have some audience Q&A. So first up, we have Jim Hart, Executive Director of Appalachian Investors Alliance, and Faith Knudsen, Director of Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Ohio University, and Director of OU's Social Enterprise Ecosystem Program. Jim and Faith, welcome. And Jim, you're up first. So as the representative from Appalachian Investors Alliance, can you help us understand why businesses need capital, why that's important, and AIA's role in helping to provide capital to businesses in Appalachia. Sure. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Um, I actually think you just said it best, right? I think that we all recognize that most businesses need capital to start, uh, and they certainly need capital to grow. 
And I think everyone on this call probably understands that, you know, we're not going to achieve that economic resilience that they talked about in the video and create jobs in the region without new businesses starting and without having readily available capital for those businesses to fuel their growth. So I think we all recognize that AIA's approach uh, to that problem is probably a little bit different. You know, we began our our mission with the recognition that there are in fact substantial pockets of capital in Appalachia, right? So while we don't have as much capital as you might find on the coastal money centers, there is certainly plenty of capital here to fund businesses. And it's not in places that you might normally associate with, right? It's places like Ashland, Kentucky, Altoona, Pennsylvania. These aren't massive communities. Um, but there's still plenty of capital there that can be organized and deployed. So what we focus on doing is going into those communities, organizing that capital into really more structured impact funds. And we provide technical assistance to help those investors gain confidence, which is absolutely critical because a lot of investors don't have a lot of experience doing private market transactions. Public markets, sure, everybody understands that, Private market transactions tend to be a little bit more complex and uh, they're more diverse. So, you know, we can take those private market transactions and you saw what they look like in that video. They're everything from Main Street to, let's say, you know, a high growth technology business. And if we do this process well, the beauty is we naturally attract capital from outside the region that follows alongside our investments. And you might say to yourself, well, you know, that's great, but does it work? And luckily the answer is yes. Uh, we were fortunate enough in the previous uh, power grant to prove that out. So over the last two and a half years, our investment funds have been able to get a 10 to one leverage on their capital. Meaning for every dollar they put in, 10 other dollars came alongside. And the best part about that is that, that most of that capital is coming from outside of the region. So we're literally stimulating capital inflows into Appalachia while not only providing better access to local capital, but access to capital that we might not have otherwise seen uh, to fuel those high growth companies. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that, that there are pockets of capital in the region, just like there are lots of businesses and entrepreneurs and ideas that need that capital to come to life you, Faith. Um, so I'm noticing that a lot of business models coming up in Appalachia are social entrepreneurship and socially conscious businesses, because obviously we're a region that we want to create economic opportunity, but we also do want to address and be cognizant of those social and socioeconomic issues facing our communities. So can you help us understand what is social entrepreneurship? And also, um, how are their capital needs maybe a little different from traditional entrepreneurs? Absolutely. And um, thanks for uh, asking me to join. So social entrepreneurship is a tricky word because it's extremely popular, yet the definition varies depending on the definer. So in broadest terms, a social enterprise is a business. That is, it makes money, which incorporates a mission. That is, a solution to a social problem as a key element of its implementation. Some social enterprises make money and make a social impact, like Tom Shoes donating a pair of shoes for everyone sold. Other social enterprises, say an enterprise like a well-known one in our region, Passionworks, make money by making a social impact. In their case, by selling artworks using upcycled or recycled materials produced in a creative environment for individuals with developmental disabilities. And some of their iconic artwork is right behind me. With this continuum of enterprises that have a mission and also make money, our program largely focuses on those that are strongly mission driven. That is, the mission is of equal or greater importance to the implementation than the money making. Some are still equity investment targets that Jim was talking about. For example, we give business technical support to a fintech company, New Resource Solutions, that connects solar investors with solar energy projects for public buildings, businesses, and low to moderate income recipients, enabling a key social good, renewable energy, for folks that would otherwise be unable to afford it. 
So that's a for-profit investable company that is a reasonable investment target. Other enterprises like Passionworks might be less interesting for equity investors seeking strong fiscal returns, but very interesting for those seeking a modest return and a very strong social impact. And so what the ARC presciently enabled by funding the social enterprise ecosystem program in 2017 was the provision of no fee enterprise development services to this sector that was previously less interesting to capital investment, thus enhancing its investability and also enhancing its capacity to self-fund through sustainable business models. Yeah, that's a really interesting concept, investability. Um, and it depends on the investor, right? And the amount of impact that they're looking for when they are adding a business to their portfolio. Um, so let's dig in a little more to impact investing. Jim, can you help us understand what impact investing is um, and maybe how it compares to other more traditional investments? I'll give it my best shot, but this is a, uh, this is a broad tent, right? Uh, just as Faith mentioned before, um, the definition is hard to pin down because there's so many people that are impact investors that are approaching the problem in a different way. Uh, so we tend to keep the definition of impact investor very broad, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is impact investing kind of at its core is really any investment where the benefits of the investment accrue not only to the investors, but also to broader society, right? And that's that's a very broad definition, I realize. But, you know, when you look at just AIA's collection of impact funds, right, we have funds that specialize in funding only black and brown founders. We have another one that focuses on worker owned businesses, right? They only want to fund cooperative structures. We have a medical device fund. We have two funds that honestly don't really invest outside of a 10 county radius. And then, you know, we have the balance that really look to limit their geography to the Appalachian region. So just in our collection of impact funds, we're talking about social and economic rebalancing, health, we're talking about local and regional development, and, and that's just in a network of 13 funds. So, you know, it, it covers a lot of area and it also talks about risk tolerance, right? Certain impact investors have different risk tolerances associated with their capital. Uh, some are very, very, very traditional debt in orientation and very low risk. Uh, some, like our funds, tend to be the first money into a deal and are taking higher risk opportunities. Uh, so I guess one thing I would like to point out, if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this and you want to go out for impact investment, uh, please do your homework because not all impact investors are alike. And you need to make sure that you're talking to the people that, again, thematically match what you're trying to do, but then also, you know, they have the type of risk capital that really matches uh, the type of investment that you're offering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so awesome that ARC partners like you all are working to help connect entrepreneurs to the right types of investors and source of capital. Um, Faith, so obviously investors are key to helping a business start so they have the capital to, to launch their venture. But also it's so important that entrepreneurs have access to technical assistance and the resources that are paired with that capital to actually truly succeed. Can you help us understand as a resource provider and service provider, um, how you fit into the impact investment and entrepreneurial ecosystem, and then how that ultimately does bring capital to businesses in the Appalachian region? Absolutely. And let me just give an overview, a little bit of the, the social enterprise sector. So as Jim was saying, those mission driven businesses in health, wellness, environment, environmental uh, educational access issues, it's larger than most people believe. So it was 9% of the national GDP in 2020. And in 2021, it employs 16% of the working population in our footprint in Ohio and West Virginia. So it's a big deal. And it crosses many of the strategic focus areas that co-chair Manchin was outlining this morning. So our power grant, which is currently led by the Foundation for Appalachian Ohio, centers on three parts of that social ecosystem, social enterprises, impact investors, and impact measurement. For social enterprises, we provide business planning tools based on sound financial principles. 
And our team, which includes multiple foundations engaged in mission-related investment as well as impact investors, also engages with traditionally philanthropic organizations to shift toward deployment of those resources as capital investments, like Jim was saying, specifically looking to identify and fill financing gaps and ultimately drive community transformation for the region. So for enterprises and funders, we often offer this social impact methodology. And my colleague and friend Ken is going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, to offer a specific illustration of the, what we do for enterprises, um, I just wanted to highlight Serenity Grove, a residential program for women in recovery. So when those founders approached us in 2018, they were all deep experts in the field, in medical fields, and many had personal experience of substance use disorder, but none had ever started an enterprise. So we brought out our toolkit for strategic, operational, and fiscal planning, which is all modified to fit the social sector. And we provided a lot of hours of no fee customized services, which harkens to the video that we watched. It's this customized professional attention that really makes a difference for those very disparate mission-driven enterprises. Within a year, Serenity Grove was fully funded in a newly owned facility and serving its first clients. So key to the services that we've offered all 170 clients we've helped is this direct business assistance to attract the capital resources, whether that's donations, grants, loans, or impact investment. And with regards to regional investment, in, in March of 2018, the ARC co-chair opened a rural impact investment symposium. And in our closing session, we local participants discussed how to bring those lessons learned from external experts into our ecosystem. This was an important impetus for our grassroots impact innovation group of funders, service providers, and investors. And we still meet monthly to assess regional deal flow <clears throat> and identify financing needs and innovate appropriate vehicles for regional funding. So early in the pandemic, that included bringing ARC reallocated funds to an enterprise sustainability resilience fund that was managed by Debbie Phillips, who spoke earlier, and, um, and also later collaboration that helped our public-private partnership. That's the Bailey's Trail project that Debbie was focusing on as well. So the key differentiator in our impact investment working group, and Jim was talking about the differences between these kind of groups, is that we're just that. We're a working group and not a formally connected entity, and we're not a fund. So we found this incredibly useful in ensuring that there's no big gorilla in the room sort of overpowering other voices from grassroots businesses and local investors. And together, nevertheless, we collaborate and we find many different funding needs through an appropriate subset of our membership as those needs are identified. Yeah, that's incredible and such a useful model that y'all are working with not only the investors to help them develop the right mindset and understanding of the types of like social ventures that we're seeing happen more and more in the region, but also again, working with the businesses um, who we have on here today, which is really exciting. So let's bring our, our business panelists up. We have Ken Allers and Nick Gilson. Um, Ken and then Nick, could you tell us a little bit about your business and its connection to Faith and Jim? So um, Habitat for Humanity of Southeast Ohio has uh, is in the process of, of launching a social enterprise called Community Renovations and Repairs, which is going to be a construction company focused on providing uh, construction services for nonprofits who are working in the income, uh, low income sector, as well as providing affordable project uh, completions for nonprofits, uh, the senior citizens and the disabled in our communities. Um, it's also going to be a job training program uh, as part of uh, the construction uh, business we will be providing job training uh, on site job training for people as well. And uh, our connection, uh, really, this this whole uh, social enterprise creation came out of our collaboration with Faith and her team uh, at the Voinovich School and uh, with with C. So that's us, and I'll turn it over to Nick. 
Thank you, Ken. Um, firstly, thank you for the work that uh, you do. I know I mentioned it backstage, but read a little bit more about everything that you're up to, and I'm just uh, blown away, impressed by your leadership and everything that you and your team are up to. So thank you. Uh, so I, I run a company called Gilson Snow. We are the number one small brand in snow sports, a very young company. We just um, just turned eight years old and are on a pretty steep growth trajectory. Uh, and as Jim has noted, it turns out growing is really expensive. Um, and uh, and so uh, thrilled to be here to chat chat more about uh, our experience working with with Jim Hart. He's been um, an, an unbelievable mentor and uh, and 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 guide to me along uh, this uh, total roller coaster of an adventure. I love that growing is expensive, costs money to make money, as they say, which leads perfectly into my next question. Can y'all talk about some of the barriers you face trying to access capital? and other needed resources to achieve that growth. And then how also did Jim and Faith help you overcome those barriers? So um, at Habitat, you know, our traditional models are, um, are kind of what, you know, Habitat's known for with our home ownership program and our critical home repair programs. And so the idea of, of kind of doing something different to that is, it, it was a challenge. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things that we needed to do uh, was to document and prove what the impact would be of a social enterprise. And that was done through Faith's team uh, with the social return on investment uh, modeling that, that her and her team were able to create for us. Uh, and so um, we talked, you guys talked about um, investability uh, and that that is absolutely true with us. We needed to create something that allowed people to see that, you know, this is we're, we're the type of organization that's going to focus more on impact than profitability. But at the same time, we needed to show that this was a needed entity and what type of impact it was going to have, because uh, it's kind of a, a little bit further away from the traditional habitat model and um, as, as far as I know, no other habitats have, have tried this, this avenue. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were grateful with that uh, for being able to access capital. That, those tools that were provided by C really helped us sell that. Uh, for, for us, it was primarily to, to get startup grants uh, and seed money. So uh, in, in our case, um, you know, I, I very much think about money like oxygen. Cash is like oxygen, right? If you don't get it to the right organs at exactly the right time, you quite literally die. Um, but we don't live to breathe or to take as many breaths as possible. Uh, and what's really interesting is that when you go for a run and you're getting up to speed, right, you start to you start to require a lot more oxygen, right? And so as things start to go, you start needing to get more money and more cash to the right departments at the right time to quite literally sustain the basic functions of life. Um, and so, you know, in our business, we very much think about cash and money as, as the same thing, right? If you don't get it to the right places, especially when you're growing, um, those departments, they atrophy and they die. And that then, you know, really impacts the greater in, you know, organization in a very devastating fashion. Um, and what's fascinating is that banks um, and, and we've got some great banking partners, so I'm not going to throw any shade right now, but they love to work with you once you're already successful. Um, and, and so there's this period where you go from zero, right? Building a business from zero up to the point where you are quote unquote, you know, bankable on a, on a, on a banker's checklist. Um, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen there. Uh, if you're doing a good job, it's actually even more expensive. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you the amount of wonderful human beings in the banking world who have come into our facilities, seen what's going on, seen our partnerships, where they think we must already be beyond bankable, right, from what it looks like from the outside. Um, but any growing business always looks, you know, six months ahead of where they actually are. Uh, and so, and so, you know, we, we've, we've been told countless times that we can, we absolutely fit into their model and we, we can absolutely bank with you guys to find out, you know, six weeks later after painstaking amounts of whatever, right? Going through the process with bankers that, you know, it's, oh, just, you know, call us back next year, right? And so, um, so, so Jim and uh, the entire AIA network uh, 
came in at a really pivotal moment in our business's development. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, you know, I, I don't know where we'd, where we'd be right now without these folks, because they've not only brought in the needed oxygen for the right departments at the right time, um, but they've helped paint the path uh, of going from here to there, right? And what got us here won't get us there. Um, it's different. And there's a real muscle memory um, that's tied to this capital, whereas, uh, you know, that just that, that wouldn't really be the case uh, with, with, with bankers. Yeah, that, that's so awesome. And that's exactly why ARC makes the investments that we do um, in partners like AIA and the SEE program, because we want to make sure Appalachian entrepreneurs, like being an entrepreneur is hard enough, but there's also extra challenges in Appalachian. So we want to make sure that we can help our partners help people like you overcome those barriers um, as, as quickly and easily as possible. Um, final question for you all. What is different about working with ARC partners like AIA or SEE, maybe compared to more traditional capital or resource providers? So on our end, um, you know, the uh, nonprofits, um, the idea of earned revenue in nonprofits is becoming more mainstream than it has been in the past. And uh, it's, it's absolutely essential, in my opinion, and it's kind of the next logical step for the nonprofit sustainability model to look into impact or long term earned revenue models. Um, the challenge is uh, getting a nonprofit who's focused on solely on mission based to start thinking like a business. Uh, and to also start thinking about how you can create impact while creating sustainability at the same time and um, not being in a position of what I call crisis mode, which seems to be always what happens in nonprofits. It's always, a, you know, moving on to the next big crisis because uh, that's what we do. We solve problems. Um, so one of the best things about working with Faith and her team and, is that we knew that, that we could create more impact as a nonprofit by doing some sort of earned revenue model. We just didn't know what that was going to look like. And so having the availability of, of the tools and the people necessary to go through business modeling and, you know, choose a couple of enterprises to kind of flirt with and, and figure out what might work and then doing a social return on investment study on it to really say, hey, this is, this is the type of impact that we're going to be able to create here. And you guys really need to get on board um, with this and, and um, creating those tools to allow us to go out and do what we can do good, good which is best, which is go out and, and sell the story, tell people what we're going to be doing and paint that picture. And, you know, it's um, the best way I can describe it is Habitat has always been about collaboration. And this is just a great example of it where um, we've been able to partner with C and, and partner with others uh, to help make this a possibility uh, in, in our region. And um, you wouldn't get that as a traditional funder. <laughs> um, even with some of the social uh, impact investors who, who I've worked with in the past, um, you know, the, the mission, it's all well and good, but, you know, there is a return that's necessary, and, and that, that's kind of where the discussion centers around uh, the, the enterprises. What is that return going to look like? With C, it's been much more focused on how can we create sustainable impact um, rather than profitability from our perspective, which is where our, our most important aspect is. I mean, we want it to be sustainable but we want it to be more impactful because I'm sure that anybody on this call who owns a home can attest to this. Finding construction professionals, and I do mean professionals, is really difficult nowadays. Uh, and so we know that there's an impact that can be made there, especially in the low and moderate income sector. And so having a, a partner like Faith and her team have been just incredibly beneficial. And I can't say enough work about uh, good things about the social return on investment model. Uh, if you haven't done a study, you, whether you're a for-profit, a social enterprise or a nonprofit, I highly suggest looking into those types of studies because that was the cornerstone of us being able to get our, our capital startup was through that study. Awesome. 
Nick? Yeah, so you know, one of the things that strikes me that stands, um, stands apart has been uh, sort of the really intense and thorough due diligence process. Um, and what I mean by due diligence is once once the group decided that they I, they, that they thought that they wanted to move forward with the business, um, you know, th there's this process where you sort of like lift up the hood and you go look, you know, at the whole engine to make sure you're not buying a lemon, right? And so there's this process where you put together a whole bunch of data about the business and um, and and you know, I'm not sure I would have said in the moment as we were going through this process that I valued it so much, but um, being on the being on the on the on the tail end of it, it's now created this um, basically this binder of really good data that's really uh, well thought through that has then become shareable. And so, as Jim was talking about the one to ten ratio, I mean that I mean that's an extraordinary. Those are extraordinary numbers you guys are putting up. That is just awesome. And you know, I I don't want to downplay the. Um, the significance of that, right? I mean, the idea that there are these pockets of capital in Appalachia, but then that they're actually becoming that they've got this gravitational force now, this magnet that's pulling in money from New York City and San Francisco um, and investing in the region. And then those dollars stay here and they get reinvested here. And it creates this sort of rippling effect over time. And so, you know, we've seen that very much uh, be the case in our business as well. Uh, you know that that intense due diligence has now been shared with coastal money right that is then followed on and uh, you know to quote jim coastal money right to, um that is now followed on and invested in the business and brought in real resources to scale this business um right here in the appalachia region and uh and and you know what's cool about that is it is very important for jim and everyone in roles like this to be looking at roi right return on investment that's important some investors start and stop there Jim does not. Um, they, in that due diligence process, they're really seeking to understand the meaning behind the investment, the value to the community, um, the upside potential of things go even better than expected, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of uh, dollars reinvested into our local communities. Um, and it's just... There's good money, there's neutral money, and there's bad money. And I just can't even begin to underscore how good it feels to be working with folks who provide good capital. Um, and that's because of all of the other benefits uh, and guidance that comes along with those investments and the ways in which it attracts other players to join the business. And you know, now, as a result of their work, right, we're taking a Pennsylvania grown raw material, sustainably harvested lumber, and we're putting it into some sweet snowboards and skis and we're shipping it as far as um, New Zealand, Australia. I mean, we're sending products back in the reverse direction to China, right? And so um, it's just cool to see now you know, working for us here in Pennsylvania, making some incredibly cool products uh, that are that supported in a way that's self-sustainable, right? But then attracting um, talent and money from uh, other parts of the country and other parts of the globe um, to create, you know, what we hope will become a globally relevant brand in this space. So anyway, I know that this is uh, where I'm signing off. So Jim, just cannot thank you enough for everything that you do. And um, to the whole uh, ARC, uh, we're just a, a debt of gratitude. So thank you all. That's awesome. Thank you, Nick. And Ken, um, incredible insights from the entrepreneur perspective. So we're close to time, but one final question for our investment experts, Jim and Faith. Can you quickly tell us, um, thanks to Nick's mention of ARC, how has ARC helped you strengthen the impact eco investment ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the social entrepreneurial ecosystem, and what is needed from here to keep growing and to get stronger and to bring more capital to Appalachian businesses? Um, yeah, I'll start that out. I mean, you know, our, our theory around our mission is that, uh, you know, Appalachian entrepreneurial ecosystems must have permanent and readily available sources of capital. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing and trying to organize these pockets of capital throughout the region it wouldn't have happened without ARC. It takes six to 12 months for us to start a fund formation process and take it to its conclusion. And we need some really patient capital there to help get through that process. And, and ARC does that. Um, and then the technical assistance that they help support on the backside, what Nick was talking about. Uh, again, none of that would happen without the ARC support. So. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, in this new iteration or our new power grant that we're going to be able to put even bigger points on the board. Uh, but I really 
appreciate the risk that ARC took in funding, you know, our organization and letting us go out and, and try some things. Um, you don't often hear the term grantor and risk in the same, you know, sentence. Uh, I think you can say that about ARC and it's pretty unique. And I think for my part, I'd really like to go back to the oxygen metaphor that Nick so eloquently used and some of the business terminology that he was sort of throwing around, uh, business modeling, due diligence, uh, return on investment. And I think that the most powerful thing that the ARC enabled for us was bringing those tools into the social sector and um, just like Ken was explaining, to actually enable those for that side of the house where indeed you really need that kind of business growth in order to have the social mission, the greater social mission, the impact that you want. And I did just want to really emphasize that sort of third area of um, the social enterprise ecosystem's focus, which is, is the measure of, of social impact. That is really cutting edge. It's a methodology that was started actually in Silicon Valley and then became much more popular in Europe and is widely used in Europe. But what, what the ARC has enabled is bringing that back and not only just bringing it back to the United States, but starting it in Appalachia, which is so cool because customers of SROI and we have qualified team members, credentialed team members to do these analyses can validate the social impact of their markets um, and more effectively tell their holistic story, just like Ken was saying. Um, so, you know, what's, what's still needed? Well, um, two things that I'd really like to emphasize. And one is that as service providers in the social sector that's looking at these intractable problems that have been mentioned so many times this morning, we really need to focus on expanding our deal flow development, another businessy word, meaning uh, growth oriented social enterprises that are you know, interested in technical assistance to the furthest flung corners of our footprint. We really need to meet, reach people who have those innovations who haven't been reached yet. And the ARC is really enabling that. And, and equally important, I think, continuing these conversations between mission-driven uh, foundation investors, family offices, the broader investment community, and the ARC, we really need to be talking nonstop about how to do these innovative investment opportunities. And that is exactly what the ARC is enabling. Awesome. Thank you all so much. This was an incredible conversation. I wish it could go on, but we're already two minutes over time. Um, to our audience, thank you for submitting questions. Since we are already running late, we're going to take those down and I'm going to work with this team to get some answers for y'all and we'll follow up soon with that information. Um, also, the SROI tool that Faith mentioned, a lot of folks are asking about that. We'll make sure that that information is available to y'all as well. It sounds really cool. Um, so again, thank you to our panelists. Give them a, a round of applause. Um, and now we're going to take another networking break. So head to your tables, chat with folks, and then we'll pick back up with our leadership panel. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>